Hello and welcome. My name is Benjamin Berger, and this is a sample lecture from Geology 6400 Advanced Stratigraphy that I teach here at Utah State University. This is a lecture in which we're talking about uh, the stratigraphy in various areas of Utah and talk a little bit about petroleum, uh, oil, and natural gas resources that are found in each of these regions. And by vote, uh, the students have selected uh, the Uinta Basin to be the topic of this lecture. Now the Uinta Basin is a very large basin in northeastern Utah and this is a satellite um, image, I think this actually comes from the International Space Station, looking toward the east across Utah. And down here you can see uh, the Great Salt Lake out here. And if you look off to the east uh, towards Colorado, you can see this large basin up here. This is the Uinta Basin. Um, to the north, it is flanked by the high Uinta Mountains. This is the highest mountain range in Utah. Uh, includes King's Peak, which is the highest mountain in Utah. And on the south, it is flanked by the Book Cliffs that extends all the way across here. Now, it's not really a basin, if you think of it. It's, it's actually elevated quite high within the state of Utah. Um, oftentimes, the old term for this region was called the Bench, which kind of makes more sense because it's a little bit higher coming off of this mountain range. Um, but Back um, when this was during the Eocene, this was a depositional center, and so we referred to that as the Uinta Basin. Now, the Uinta Basin has a long history of geologists working within the Uinta Basin. Probably the first and most famous uh, geologist to uh, travel through the Uinta Basin was John Wesley Powell, who did his surveys in the 1860s and passed through the Uinta Basin, describing the people that he met, uh, describing the geology, collecting fossils, and making recordings. And much of the very early geology that we know about the Uinta Basin come from this survey. Now, he traveled down the Green River. So um, when the Transcontinental Railroad was built, there was a station in Green River, Wyoming. And that meant that you could float down the river from Green River, Wyoming, up here, um, down the Green River, all the way down through the Uinta Basin until you got to the Colorado River and he went all the way down the Colorado into the Grand Canyon. So this is a huge uh, trek across eastern Utah studying the geology. Um, today the two rivers that we're going to be kind of talking about is the White River that comes across here and the Green River that comes across. And where they meet is the town of Ure or Ure and that is named after Chief Ure who is one of the northern uh, Ute uh, tribal leaders um, back in the 1870s, and his wife, who's equally as famous, Chipita. And today, most of the Uinta Basin is on uh, the northern Ute uh, tribal lands during the late Cretaceous. So we're looking here at uh, basically the depositional system that existed um, from western Utah to eastern Colorado. And what you see here is a classic foreland basin system. So we had the severe orogeny belt that is where the modern day Wasatch Mountains are um, located um, down here. You have a huge amount of these conglomeratic arcosic facies coming off of this mountain range. And then out here we have um, this inner tonguing with fluvial, some lacustrian, some marsh type deposits going out to some tidal deposits, interfingering with this marine unit that includes the Manco Shale. And so you can see this in fingering. So this is a classic foreland basin system in the late Cretaceous. So we have to go from this type of system to a completely different type of system when we talk about the Uinta Basin. What most people think that happened and, and argue is, is that there was an uplift, the Laramide uplift, that occurred at, in the late Cretaceous. It extended up even into the Eocene. And it was the last gasp of the Laramide orogeny that gave us the Uinta Basin. Now, there's various theories out there for the Laramide orogeny, and the Laramide orogeny is a big mystery in geology. The prevailing theory is that there is a plate that um, was subducted underneath the North American plate called the Farallon Plate. And the Farallon Plate um, was shallowly subducted, and the shallowing caused um, this plate to come up in contact with the North American continent. And this shallow plate coming underneath was what caused the Rocky Mountains to come up. Now, 
there's been all these models that have been done. This is some models that have been done by uh, Peter uh, Bird, trying to look at sort of um, how this uh, would have occurred and sort of the timing of this uplift and the various uh, faults and features that you see in the uplift. Now, one thing to point out is that most of their mountain ranges are sort of in this interesting uh, north-south orientation. However, if you look at the Uinta Mountains, the Uinta Mountains go east-west. And this is the only mountain range in North America, in the western United States, that run east-west. And so this is a big mystery of why this mountain range runs east-west. What was its origin? It's one of those great classic uh, geology mysteries. So the Uinta Mountains are probably the most mysterious mountain range in North America. Um, and we don't really have a good idea of what caused the uplift of the Uinta Mountains. We know that they started um, coming up during the Eocene, so during the very last portion of the Laramide orogeny, um, which is kind of interesting. And once they started to come up, they started to form a basin that accumulated sediments that were coming off this very large mountain range to the south. Now, um, in the Uinta Basin, we have a very, very thick sequence of sedimentary rocks. And today what we're going to look at is only um, a very small portion of those rocks near the top. Um, these are going to be the rocks that are um, the richest in terms of oil and natural gas, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And these are from the Cenozoic Air, um, from the Eocene Epoch, so they're all Eocene in age. And on the bottom we have the Wasatch, it's also referred to as the Colton Formation, the Green River Formation on top of that and the Uinta Formation and the Duchesne River Formation. And all of these are Eocene in age. The Eocene runs from 55 to 34 million years ago. The best place to go see the Colton Formation is on the margins of the Uinta Basin. This is Mormon Gap, which is um, just across the border in Colorado. And uh, you can see there's actually um, the railway that comes through. This provides a, a coal for the power plant that powers the city of uh, Vernal. And this is a uh, Mormon Gap here. And this ridge right here is uh, Raven Ridge and Squaw Ridge, uh, two ridges that extend on the very edge of the basin. And it's here where you actually see the Colton Formation. The Colton Formation is um, a fluvial, uh, paleosoil rich, uh, more terrestrial upland type of unit. It's fairly thin in the um, in Utah. On top of the Colton Formation, we have this contact here of the Green River Formation. The Green River Formation is a lacustrian unit, uh, meaning that it was formed in lakes. Um, here's along the same ridge, so this is Raven Ridge, and you're looking at the Colton-Wasatch Formation, which is kind of early Eocene, and the Green River Formation, which is middle Eocene there. And you can see the contact really well from these sort of uh, overbank, uh, fluvial, paleosoil, sort of variegated beds, mudstone, siltstones dominated. The Green River includes some units that are carbonate-rich, um, in including some, uh, some units that have a lot of uh, gastropods um, within them. Uh, snails, snail fossils. Um, also, it tends to be very laminate because it was formed in these, uh, these shallow lakes. These shallow lakes extended all the way across Utah. Um, the oldest part of this lake system actually extends down to an area called Flagstaff uh, down here, which is probably uh, started in the Paleocene, and it extended out um, into the basin. And this was in part by uh, cutting off the drainage of the basin that occurred during the Laramide orogeny, the late Laramide orogeny. And this big, huge lake system is called Lake Uinta. There's a similar lake system um, that's found in Wyoming. This includes Fossil Lake, which is found near Fossil Butte, Wyoming, and Lake Goshoop, which is found in the Gr Green River Basin. And these probably extended, and there was probably some connection in uh, the northern part right over here of Colorado and sort of northwestern Colorado. And so we had the uh, Uinta Mountain Range up during the Eocene coming up, and you had this very large lake that developed. They extended all the way into western Colorado. Now, one of the interesting places you can go uh, is to that um, edge of the boundary between uh, Utah and Colorado, and this is Douglas Pass. And we're looking at the Green River Formation. The Green River Formation on Douglas Pass actually sits right on top of the Mesa Verde uh, group, uh, Mesa Verde Formation. 
that is late Cretaceous, and so we don't have the Colton formation exposed here. It probably was never deposited. Um, so that means that the there was an uplift um, called the Douglas Pass Arch that existed that kind of separated the Uinta Basin from its sister basin, the Piance Creek Basin in western Colorado. Now, the Green River is famous for its fossils, in particular its fossil fish. This is the museum here in Vernal, uh, showing a lot of these uh, amazing fossils, tons of fossil fish, including the um, state fossil from Wyoming, Nydia. Um, also beautiful leaves have been found in the Green River Formation, and uh, beautiful insects, and there's a number of museums dedicated to it, including Fossil Butte National Monument in Wyoming. So the Green River is uh, the lacustrine unit. It's a very thick unit uh, of these lacustrine units that developed in this shallow lake system. And um, it's characterized by very thinly bedded um, lacustrine type um, carbonate rich rocks. But it's also characterized by um, oil shale. And so we'll talk more about the oil shell that's found in the Green River Formation and, and where we have a source for um, natural gas and petroleum. Now, within the Green River, there's one unit that's extremely rich in oil shale, um, in organic carbon, and that's the mahogany bed. The mahogany bed is best exposed in places like Cowboy Canyon, which is kind of south of Jensen, um, south of Naples, and um, heading out into along the uh, the White River. And the mahogany um, bed is famous. It's been described as a very rich area in terms of oil shell, although there's some other rich areas of uh, rich bands of oil shell within the Green River Formation. This is um, a map showing the um, outcrops of the mahogany um, outcrop along the Book Cliffs kind of region, following it all the way across the basin, which kind of highlights the uh, basin. We'll talk a little bit more about the mahogany bed as being sort of the source for um, petroleum within the Uinta Basin. On top of the Green River Formation, we have the Uinta Formation. The Uinta Formation is probably best known for its fossils. Uh, this is a Uinta Therium, a strange and weird creature that's known from the Uinta Basin. And uh, the Uinta Formation is fluvial. You can see this wonderful fluvial channel here with some overbank deposits and also some paleosoils, so variegated beds. Um, it's more sandy at the bottom member, the A member, and it gets less sandy as you go up and it becomes more muddy and variegated at the top of the uh, formation. And then you move into the Duchesne River Formation. The Duchesne River Formation is extremely red. And this is in part due to the fact that it was an upland area, very well drained. It's also filled with arcosic sediments, many conglomerates, massive conglomerates that were being shed off the high Uinta Mountains. Um, this is a geological map of the extent of the Duchesne River Formation across the northern part of the Uinta Basin. Uh, fairly thick unit. It's split into uh, four different members, the Brennan Basin member, the Dry Gulch member, the Low Point member, and the uh, Star Flat member. Um, and uh, here's Vernal and the University of Utah campus in Vernal uh, on this map. Now, one of the things that makes the Uinta Basin so important in terms of exploration for oil and natural gas is that it is one of the places for what we refer to as an unconventional play. And there's been a lot of these unconventional plays um, that are scattered throughout the United States that have been in the news. This includes uh, unconventional places like the Wilston Basin in North Dakota. You have the Appalachian Basin back east in places like Pennsylvania, New York. Um, and then you also have like the Uinta Basin out here and, the, and its neighbor, the Piance Creek Basin. And so these are two, uh, two basins um, that have unconventional plays. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, energy resources. So oil and gas and natural gas um, are petroleum. They're formed um, in either a marine or freshwater environment. So here when we talk about the Uinta Basin, we're talking about a freshwater lake system. Um, during burial, organic compounds that have been photosynthesizing, organisms that have been photosynthesizing, build up organic matter, um, hydrocarbons. They die, they get buried, and they get um, matured. 
and they get very mature and then they start to migrate up once they become mature and become oil and natural gas they migrate up and if you don't have a trap they will escape up at the surface now when we talk about traditional conventional petroleum uh, um, plays um, we're looking at sort of ways of structural traps or stratigraphic traps some sort of way to prevent that oil and natural gas from reaching the surface. And we've been talking in class a lot about stratigraphic traps, right? So something like this. We've, you know, kind of mentioned some reef traps that you have like in Saudi Arabia and salt domes that you have in the Gulf of Mexico um, and sort of the more traditional anaclinal traps that we have in like places like Pennsylvania. So in any case, these are basically traps um, for petroleum. When we talk about unconventional plays, we're talking about um, that there wasn't necessarily a trap. In fact, there's no real uh, trap, there's no real um, reservoir, there's no real source. So all three of those are combined in unconventional plays. And there's four basic types of unconventional um, plays. There are tar sands. Tar sands are deposits of dense, thick asphalt-like um, oil that's called tar. You have oil shale. This is a wax-like compound. Um, called kerogen, and it's found in fine-grained sedimentary rocks. Another one that's thrown in here, in here, but it's still very experimental, is gas hydrates. Gas hydrates are deposits of frozen methane in the permafrost and in the seafloor, and that is a unconventional um, source of hydrocarbons. N still very unconventional. And then you have things called tight sand gas, um, and these are basically natural gas that's trapped within a sandstone that has very limited porosity and permeability. So in the Uinta Basin, the two kind of sources of uh, hydrocarbons that we're going to be seeing is comes from tar sands and oil shell. So this makes uh, the Uinta Basin an unconventional play um, compared to others. And so we'll take a look at this. Now, oil shell has been driving the economy of uh, eastern Utah, western Colorado, and southwestern Wyoming for years. When I was a kid, everybody was talking about uh, oil shell, and there was a couple booms of oil shell. When prices of uh, oil go certain to a certain height, the um, economic value of actually uh, of, of mining for oil shell comes in. And so these are very rich areas for oil shell. Now, oil shell is what we are talking about in this mahogany bed, and it's it's not mature. It hasn't been buried deep enough to really get the uh, petroleum that you see in many of these groups. And so it's kind of like looking at a, uh, a petroleum field before it's really gotten mature. So this bed was not buried deep enough and under hot enough temperatures to turn it into oil. So the interesting thing when we look at the Uinta Basin is this pattern of um, the burial of organic rich um, phytoplankton stuff that are living in these shallow lake systems. And also we had some evaporitic deposits that were happening as well in the Green River. And this is all happening during the during the period of the Green River uh, formation. And the Uinta and the Piance Creek Basin are the two basins that kind of uh, this accumulated. And so you have different sort of natures of the different lake systems that occurred. And so the would spill over the Douglas Creek Arch into each other, um, creating this sort of uh, dual systems. The Green River Formation extends all the way across here. But occasionally you get oil shell, and then you get a band of um, things like uh, halite and uh, nacolite, which are different types of evaporitic uh, minerals that are deposited. Some of those are actually sought after for um, for their mineral resources. Now, what really got um, the Uinta Basin being a, a hopping place in terms of drilling was the technology driven by fracking, which was actually developed um, in, in uh, the Uinta Basin. And so it's, it has a long history of fracking that have been going on in the Uinta Basin for uh, numerous years. And um, so what fracking does is basically you drill down uh, and you do what's referred to as a horizontal drilling. So you drill down to a bed. In this case, it's the mahogany bed. And then you switch that um, drill over to being horizontal. So you follow that bed, that rich bed. And then what you do is basically you 
frack it. And the fracking is basically you can do two things. You can do physical fracking, which you kind of set off little explosions or detonations. And that will then open up the pore spaces within that shale and, uh, and produce uh, natural gas. The other thing you can do is in, in basically put down various fluids, um, some acids, things like that, that will actually open up and break open the rocks. Um, and then basically you then collect um, that opens up those pores and then you set it up with a usually with a compressor station and suck out the natural gas and oil if you can find it uh, coming out of that uh, fracking and usually this is driven by the natural gas so natural gas they require the most amount of fracking that they do uh, oftentimes drilling as many wells as possible in very tight configurations now um, there's been a number of other technologies that people have explained. It. This is a uh, experimental uh, station in the Ralston field in the Peons Creek Basin that Shell Petroleum has put together, um, looking at ways of getting that uh, oil shale out. And a lot of these were set up to actually heat up that oil shale. And so the idea is you, you pump in really hot water and heat it up, and then that will bring up the, uh, the oil in the subsurface. The problem with this is that you have to have the energy to heat up the water then to get the oil to come out. And so you have to have a net energy um, output to make this even profitable. So one of the things about the Uinta Basin is that it's been drilled like crazy because of all this fracking activity of closely spaced wells, particularly in the natural gas area regions of the basin. So this is a map of um, all the wells that have gone in in Duchesne and Uinta County. You can see the city of Vernal is right there. Uh, Salt Lake is over on this side. These green ones are oil. Um, so we have a lot of oil. And then the red ones are natural gas. And so you see that there's natural gas mostly in sort of the southeastern part of the basin, whereas the northwestern part of the basin is mostly oil. Um, these are the various names of the various units within the Uinta Basin. Um, some of the big ones, the biggest one is probably the uh, Natural Buttes um, uh, play and unit out here. And that's mostly um, Anadarko that's been drilling out there. And it's a natural gas um, area with lots of fracking that's been going on out there in that region. Um, you then have the Red Wash, um, which has some um, oil in it. Um, and that one's mostly driven by Questar. And then we have Monument Butte out here, this unit, which is mostly um, uh, run by Newfield. And then you have some other ones out here that are run by some other smaller companies um, like, uh, um, oh, let's see who else is out there. Um, XTO, which is a part of ExxonMobil, has some things out there, um, as well as uh, um, Petrograph has been doing some mining out there. And a lot of this has been moving north. Um, and this is where a lot of the growth in the areas up in the Bluebell and Altamont, um, north of the Duchesne River. And most of those actually um, are producing oil. And that might be because that part of the basin was the deepest buried. And so it's closer to the mountains. And so you had a lot more sediment. So those areas along that front there were the deepest of the basin and so probably matured enough to produce some of the oil, whereas some of the areas to the south um, that are producing the natural gas were probably not as deeply buried. Now, one of the big problems about um, all of this drilling and activity that's been going on in the Uinta Basin is dealing with the disposal water that's produced in all of this activity. And so there are hundreds of evaporation ponds scattered throughout Utah um, that are basically lined up and then they dump this disposal water in there and they just wait for it to evaporate and then they gather up the uh, the material and dispose of that solid material later on either refine it um, or do a variety of different things um, to try to get the salts that are out of this uh, water that's coming up is brine water so it's extremely salty because it's coming up from the salt uh, rich green river formation so it tends to have a lot of salt causes a lot of problems with machinery and stuff because it uh, is very reactive. Um, it also is um, a big pollutant within the Uinta Basin. So there's a push to try to deal with some of the evaporation ponds. Um, on the top of the Green River Formation are these things called the saline facies. It's in the Uinta Basin. And these are the saltiest 
parts of the Green River Formation. It also forms an aquifer called the Bird's Nest Aquifer. And uh, there's been a couple studies of looking at the, uh, this aquifer in the Uinta Basin, trying to kind of uh, see if it's being contaminated with all this activity going on and whether the groundwater um, is moving through reaching some of these uh, river systems. And so this is a study that the Utah Geological Survey did of the Uinta Basin water supply. There's not very many wells that go down to this aquifer. It's out in the basin. It's very dry. There's only like a handful of wells that go down to it, but it's an important one in terms of uh, being a transportation uh, underground uh, aquifer to get to the river systems within the basin. Now, one of the weirdest things I think about the Uinta Basin is its gilsonite. Now, what is gilsonite? Well, gilsonite is a weird resinous um, hydrocarbon that's only found in the Uinta Basin. And it's found in the southeast corner of the basin. And um, gilsonite is actually a trademark name um, put together by uh, the American gilsonite when it was first discovered back 100 years ago. And gilsonite is um, um, it's also known as Uint uintaite, named after the Uinta Basin. Gilsonite is this resinous hydrocarbon, and it's found in these fault zones. So these are normal fault zones. And you can see this is a mine where they've gone along and mined it. So it's found on these like straight lines, normal faults. They're extensional faults. So what ended up happening is as the hydrocarbons were maturing in that oil shale, it released some of the stuff that started to migrate up. And it moved through these fault systems that were opening up in the southeast corner of the basin. And those hydrocarbons came up, and they ended up being deposited within these, um, these faults. Now, gilsonite is actually fairly flammable. Um, and so they always have problems with uh, these uh, mines catching fire is one of the big worries. Um, it's oftentimes ground up and used in lubricants. Um, it's used in paint, a lot of paint, uh, and used in making various tars and pitches and things like that. Um, so it has hundreds and thousands of uses, uh, but it's not necessarily mined as a use for energy or for fuel. The other thing that's kind of strange about the Uinta Basin is the tar sands. And you may have been hearing about the tar sands in the Uinta Basin, fairly controversial. The, one of the places where you get tar sands is at Asphalt Ridge, Utah, which actually is, Asphalt Ridge is, runs right next to the campus. In fact, it's just like you know, half a mile um, near the campus of Utah State University here in the uh, Uinta Basin in Vernal. And uh, the Asphalt Ridge um, has, uh, as its name suggests, has uh, asphalt and these tar sands. And these tar sands are actually developed because of the Mesa Verde group that's underlying here. So we have the Wasatch, the Green River, Duchesne, Uinta formations. But right on Asphalt Ridge, there's this pinch out here of uh, the Mesa Verde group that comes up to the surface. And underneath that is the Manco Shale. The Manco Shale is a marine unit, and it's a source rock. It produced a lot of hydrocarbons that have migrated into the sandstone of the Mesa Verde. Because of the structural slip on the edge of the basin, um, this area, this sand became impregnated, impregnated, became impregnated with uh, tar, with um, uh, oil, and it's actually mined right off of uh, um, Asphalt Ridge. Now, there's big plans to do big, huge open pit um, tar sands uh, work, but there's also a lot of local opposition to the tar sands here in Vernal. And so in part because here is the city of Vernal right here, and the campus is right there. So these, this, this, um, this play out here of the um, rich tar sands sits right within uh, the city, and so in people's backyards and stuff. So a lot of people are pretty upset about whether um, Asphalt Ridge will be further developed. There's two mines that I know of right now that are mostly just using that for tar for making asphalt, um, but there's plans of actually breaking that down and, and uh, heating it. So lots of people are looking at some of the tar sand development in Canada and kind of freaking out because it's such an environmental mess, and having that within a large metropolitan city is kind of scary. <laughs> So who knows, um, um, some of that land is uh, BLM is federal land, so it'll depend a little bit on how 
outraged the citizens are in terms of the development of tar sands. So that is the Uinta Basin. Um, it's a great place to visit. The Uinta Basin is a very cool and interesting uh, geology. And I hope this was informative and uh, got you thinking a little bit about the Uinta Basin, uh, the Uinta Mountains, and sort of their relationship. A lot of mystery still to solve with the uh, Uinta Basin, in particular the tectonic activity um, that defines it is still kind of a mystery. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys later. Take care.